author of four books. He's also held appointments at Duke University, Stanford Law School, Emory, and Singularity University. But that's just the beginning. He's also been named as one of the world's top global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine and a leader of tomorrow by Forbes. I could go on and on, but let's you know start the conversation by welcoming Vivek. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's really a pleasure to have you here. I'm sure we'll get a lot of you know, questions coming up. But to start the ball rolling, let me start by asking you that, you know, um, given this pandemic, um, how do you see the education, uh, the higher education thing changing? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get the questions in place. But how do you see um, Ram, it's a very this strange. pandemic impacting higher education across the world? And more importantly, what fundamental changes can we expect in the way the student community worldwide looks at studying abroad? Ram, the change already, it's like a, 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 a tornado hit the education sector because for the last three months, we've been teaching online. I mean, uh, this whole semester, I've been teaching online because, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, at Carnegie Mellon University, and we have a lot of Chinese students. So at the beginning of the semester, uh, I, I, you know, I, when I started reading about Wuhan, I checked the background of some of us. Mm -hmm. Students and some, several of them, I made it optional for our students to be in class physically because at CMU, we have very good video conferencing facilities. We have several cameras in every room and we can broadcast over, uh, you know, online. It's actually over Zoom. I don't trust Zoom, but it's over Zoom. And uh, so what I did was I made it optional and about half of the students took us up on it. A few weeks later, the, the university said it's mandatory now for everyone to be teaching uh, online. So we've had to restructure our entire curriculum. I mean, I was ready for it. My son Tarun teaches with me, Tarun Wadwa teaches with me, and we redid our entire curriculum so we could teach it online. But the rest of the university was in shock. The uh, professors had no idea what to do. There were dozens of emails being exchanged every day from faculty who had no idea how to handle this. What do we do? How do we do this? But the fact is that the world changed in the last uh, couple of months and education has become online. Mm -hmm. That's that's you know you're saying that education is online. It's been going online for a while now, but would you agree that you know um, students studying abroad go there not just for the I mean that but also for the campus experience as well? And how is that going to change? Yeah, that's a big problem because yeah. effectively uh, our students are being shortchanged. They didn't come here to stay in their little dorm rooms or their or their awful apartments and you know go on a small uh, screen and be listening to their professors. They could have done that back in Bangalore or in Wuhan. So this is a big problem for our students that um, they're missing out on the experience. I mean, and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the idea. Okay. So, um, you know, how how do you think post this pandemic universities are going to reassure students that their campuses are safe? Well, uh, I think that this pandemic will blow over because we will build immunity. If you look at the data now, you know, 21% of New York uh, has antibodies, which means that 21% uh, of the population has already been exposed to the virus and they didn't show a strong reaction to it or they recovered from it. Now, mm -hmm. soon 70, 80% of the population will get there and then you'll build herd immunity and we'll get over this pandemic. So. This will come and this will go. And we'll have vaccines, we'll have all sorts of technology advances. We can have a separate discussion on that, but this one will pass, but there will be future pandemics. But you know, getting back to the question you asked earlier, that the change that has occurred is, is fundamental now, that um, forever now we know that we can teach online, that we know that we can get all the knowledge we want from anywhere in the world, and that we can uh, start evolving the education system. This is a permanent change now. Yes, but you know, I can understand that happening for, let's say, the arts and the humanities. But what happens to you know subjects where you actually need practical, hands-on kind of teaching? I mean, for engineering and medicine and stuff like that. Uh, Ram, the uh, subjects I teach are the most. I teach the most advanced course on exp exponential technologies in the world. Literally, we teach every, we teach our students everything from artificial intelligence to network sensors, robotics, nanotechnologies, quantum computing. 
We teach them how technologies converge, and when they converge, they disrupt industries. And then we teach them methods of management, the latest techniques in innovation and management. And the goal is to teach these students how to change the world, how to get them to now brainstorm, how to crowdsource ideas, and to solve global problems. So mine is, is one of the most difficult courses you could possibly have in terms of needing interactivity. We get our students to be in groups from the beginning of the semester. We get them to be in, student, in groups of five. You know, normally the way professors teach is that you, you know, do these lectures, students go back and rectify everything, they memorize, it's wrote in memorization, and then they do exams. I don't do any of that. The way Tarun and I teach is that we get our students to be in groups of five, and then we post challenges to them every week, and they're required to, to meet with each other and brainstorm, and then they come back and they present their challenges. Instead of assignments, what we do is we have them write blog posts. We first put it on Medium so that it's anonymous. And then after we've, you know, we have given them feedback and had them improve it, we have them put it on the LinkedIn profiles. So their, okay. assignments, their class assignments are now you know, on their resumes. Essentially. So that causes a complete different change in behavior because no longer are they doing assignments that no one is going to read. They're now having to really think about what they say. And they're really having to you know, work with other people as a, as a team. So this is a, my curriculum. Imagine now going from, from regular classroom meetings and which we would get groups to meet offline and, be, and, and do all of this, to suddenly having to do this online. We figured it out. We could do it. So our students, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the feedback is going to be. I expect that they're going to give us, you know, um, in previous semesters, our classes have been the highest ranked, not only in the entire School of Engineering, but amongst the highest ranked in the entire university. I expect that we're going to get the same feedback from students this semester because we've had them uh, now work. You see, there's no reason why they can't communicate in groups online. They're just like you, and I, you can have groups of five people here and they can be talking online. There's no reason why they can't be doing web searches and, and, and studying online. So this is what we did. We transformed our entire, entire curriculum to an online curriculum. So the point I'm making to answer your question is that if we can do it, for this really advanced uh, course. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I was thinking, I we was asking for almost separate, anything. Yes, but I was asking a slightly separate kind of a question that, you know, when you have something like medicine where you actually have to touch, you know, uh, uh, things and feel things, how does that, how do you do replicate that at, at people's, I mean, uh, online? Yeah. That's much harder because if you're going to have to build things, we still have to do that. Now, um, you, know, you know, when it comes to medicine, actually, if you move forward three or four years, virtual reality will advance to the point that you can go in and do medical experiments in, in virtual reality. I mean, this sounds like it's out of science fiction, but imagine dissecting a body in, uh, <coughs> in, um, with a headset on. This sort of technology will be available in the next four or five years. So. We're going to be doing a lot more in virtual reality uh, things, but getting to your point, nothing takes care of the real world experience. So you do need a, a mix of it. And also education can't be all online because a lot of it is teamwork, team building. You know, this gets back to ancient Indian philosophy and, and wisdom that we had the guru, we had the shiksa, we had the disciple. And it was always a one on one thing. Now, technology is going to change some of that so that a lot of the one to one is going to be done using artificial, artificial intelligence and virtual reality. And a lot of it mm -hmm. is the way we're doing right now. But still, the human aspect of it can't be changed. So you still need to have people getting together physically and, and, and meeting each other, conversing with each other. So, so it may become 70-30 or 80-20, where a lot of the, the knowledge transfer is done online. However, the team building, the, uh, you know, the human, human part of it is done in person. You can never replace that. No AI, no virtual reality will ever replace the human element. Because not everybody can get a 3D printer or something to start working on those things. Because I mean, uh, that would be difficult. But the cost do you of think technology uh, will drop to the point that everyone can get it? Because the fact is that even the poorest of the poor in India now can watch this broadcast. That uh, mm -hmm. you know, no matter where you are in India now, you have a smartphone and you have internet access, so you can be watching this, right? And this five years ago, this was not imaginable because internet was so expensive, smartphones were so expensive. Now, literally. You know, the, the beggars have smartphones. Soon they're going to be demanding you give them, you know, money via QR codes or Paytm, right? So this is how much things have changed in the last five years. If you move forward another five years, you'll have another revolutionary set of changes 
by which everyone will have access to advanced technologies in their homes, in their villages, and we can revolutionize education. This is a huge opportunity that entrepreneurs have to transform India, by the way. Okay, coming back to India, you know, you have a lot of students who have sort of come back home just before the lockdown. Some of them are still locked down in the US. What kind of advice would you have for them? Ram, well, this is a much more difficult question because um, it used to be that students came to the United States. You know, I've been researching immigration for the last 15 years or so. I published many papers which looked at the uh, success of Silicon Valley. Uh, what I documented was that 52% of the startups, 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley were founded by immigrants. And the largest founding group were Indians. About 26% of that cohort were Indians. Indians were conquering Silicon Valley as far as innovation goes. And uh, the reason we, you know, students came to the United States was to learn, and then they fell in love with the country and ended up staying. That's how it used right. to be 15, 20 years ago. And that's what made Silicon Valley what it is. That's what Amer gave America a strategic global advantage. But over the last 10 or 15 years, the country became nativist. The, the immigration policies were became deeply flawed to the point that um, we started turning immigrants away. I wrote a book called Immigrant Exodus, which documented this trend. What I predicted was that within, you know, by 2020 or so, the tide would have turned, that um, the students wouldn't want to be here anymore. They wouldn't want to come here uh, because they won't be allowed to stay. And that the innovation centers would move to China and to India. That's exactly what happened. All the things I wrote about have happened. So now with, with Donald Trump and, uh, you know, what's happening, we went from bad to worse. It became xenophobic. Now they've shut off all immigration. As of today, immigration has been shut down. This is you know, really stupid immigration policy because America was getting a free gift from the world, that the world's best and brightest were coming to America and bringing their knowledge, their talent, their money with them. Now it doesn't make sense anymore. So students that were coming here to become, uh, you know, to gain the American experience and to get, to get practical work experience here and then to stay here, forget it. That door is closed for you. And, and even if uh, you know uh, Joe Biden wins or the Democrats win, it's not going to matter because uh, what's going to happen in the next two or three or four years is that the economy is going to be very weak. And whenever economies are weak, um, you always blame immigrants. The same thing happened in India, by the way. The same thing. It's not only America. India also has become xenophobic. You know, it also has been attacking foreigners. So I can attack America, but India has to look itself in the mirror and look at what it's been doing. It's the same in every part of the world. We're human beings. Human beings are imperfect animals and we do stupid things. <clears throat> so this is what's happening right now in America and the rest of the world. So immigration is not going to change in the next two or three or four years. So the students, the next cohort of students, if they want to come to immigrate, forget it. This is not the place for you. If you're coming to America, come here strictly to learn and to get that experience we were talking about of interacting with people. So you think the so-called American dream has changed fundamentally? The American, American immigration dream uh, for the last, next two or three or four years is in hibernation. That um, mm -hmm. immigrants can no longer come here the way they did before and share in its success. But this will change because America goes through cycles of this. That what happens is that uh, immigrants built this great country. And then, uh, you know, whenever they came here, they were resented because they took jobs away. Or that's what the fear was. When the economy starts getting weaker, you start blaming immigrants for taking jobs away. And then the economy does well again, and everyone starts cheering immigrants again, saying, bring us more, bring us more. They give us an advantage. So it goes through cycles. America's going to go through the same cycle. It's going to wake up again. And it's going to welcome immigrants again. But it may take as long as five years before that change happens. So again, for the cohort of students that I think of coming here, the short term, forget it. America is not welcoming you. And, and and I apologize on behalf of America because this is just the way things go. Okay, we have a question coming in from Swamitra Mishra, who's asking that you know who's actually praising you, and then he's saying that after this crisis, will China remain a preferred destination for Indian students to study abroad? No, China is the worst of the worst of the worst. I mean, China already is becoming xenophobic. Look at the way they've been attacking Africans. I mean, just Google China and Africans. And what they've been doing is they've been blaming foreigners, Africans, for the coronavirus. They invented this bloody thing. And now they're blaming the, uh, the Africans for doing this to them, right? The next thing they're going to start blaming the Indians. They're going to start blaming the Americans. I wouldn't recommend anyone go to China now because it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Its economy is going to start sinking because suddenly now there's an, there's an urgent need for America and Europe to move manufacturing out of China. 
which means that a third of the economy is going to start imploding because suddenly they can't, they're not going to get the free lunch that they've had. And then Americans and Indians and, China and uh, Europeans don't trust China anymore. So they're not going to let it steal intellectual property the way it did before. So it's going to lose a lot of the advantages had before. So China is going to become more xenophobic, more nationalistic. I wouldn't advise anyone to go to China. But, you know, you mentioned factory of the world that China was, but a Chinese uh, professor once told me that they don't no longer want to be a factory of the world because they're going in, in investing very heavily in robotics and, you know, uh, artificial intelligence and things like that. That would be the cutting edge stuff that most people would want to learn, even from outside. I mean, that's, is, is that that's, a, um, yeah, the world is not going to let China steal from it the way it did before. So that free lunch is over. So China may want to advance there, but the fact is the vast majority of its economy right now still depends on manufacturing. And manufacturing mm -hmm. is returned to, to Western shores, and it may even move to India to a large extent if India can get its act together. Okay, okay. So let's look at it from the US university's point of view. How will this impact their sort of you know uh, outlook towards uh, students coming in? You know, as I tweeted uh, last night, that the free lunch for American universities is over. That they would mm -hmm. get Indian and Chinese students coming there and paying full price. You know what, what happens here? Like I live in California. If you at, at, you know go to UC Berkeley, you get you pay in-state tuition. In-state tuition is sorry, we seem to have lost the part of her. Yeah. Um, I'm still yeah, here. Hmm. So um, um, foreigners coming here pay two, three, four times as much as American students do for the same education. So American universities could make big profits from foreign students. This is why they gave, almost gave. They, they, they don't say they did this, but you know this was the money maker for them. So <laughs> they would give preference to uh, the high paying students. Again, this is not the official policy, but this is effectively what happened over here. Well, now that the Chinese. are not welcome here it's good mm -hmm. they'll have to adjust their business models and they'll have to mm -hmm. now focus on on providing affordable education to american students which is right a good thing for america and america i'm here mm -hmm. okay so you know uh President Trump has already announced a sort of a ban on, you know, a temporary ban on immigrants and things like that. But does that impact students as well in many ways? I mean, does that sort of, you yeah. know, people who, as you mentioned, who are coming in? Yeah, you, are you kidding? Uh, because yeah. um, students, you know, when they come here, they, they, they take big loans from their family or they may take loans from banks or so on to come here. And then they want to pay them off. So in the past, you would work for two or three years on an OPT visa. And then you'd hope to get an H-1B visa, and then you'd hope to get a green card. Well, uh -huh. President Trump has just closed the doors on immigration. Now, I don't know what it means for OPT visas, but I tell you, American companies are no longer looking at foreign students as, uh, as potential recruits because they know that the doors are closed. So these students now are in a state of panic because they have no choice but to leave. And so now this semester is horrible for them because not only can't they go to, you know, to university to get the experience they came for, they're locked up in their apartments and so on, and then they may not be able to get uh, visas and the jobs aren't there. So it's really become very difficult for students and it'll be like this for the next year or two. Uh -huh. But you know, we were talking about America all this time. A lot of Indian students also tend to go to other countries in Europe and Australia and all those places. Do you think uh, they might pick up some of the slack? They might, but you know, it's not the same. You go to Europe and it, Europe, you know, the reason why people came to America is because America is a melting pot. It's an amazing place to be. That even with the xenophobia read about, America is not xenophobic. America is a wel welcome, is a wonderful welcoming place that you can be here and you're equal to everyone. People don't treat you with sus suspicion or disrespect. Y yes, there are a few, you know, wackos. The extremists here, just like they are in India. You have the same problem in India, by the way. You've got the extremists, right? Mm -hmm. Same problem over here, but by and large, the country is very welcome, very you know, open, and so on. And the education system is amazing. This is why students came over here. Mm -hmm. Australia, you go to. Mm -hmm. Australia, I, I studied in Australia, by the way. 
you know, you, you, you'll find that the, stu- the schools are filled with colleges that are many students. It's all Indian and Chinese. Why do you need to go to Australia to get uh, be in class with, you know, 100 Indians when you can do that in Bangalore, right? So uh, Australian education, I, 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 you know, it, there are some good schools and so on, but Europe, it's very difficult uh, to merge in or to really be one with, with the thing. So America used to be the best place to come to study. There's no, there's no real, you know, good second to America. Okay. okay. Now let's look at it from the Indian perspective. Do you think Indian should see this? Indian universities should see this as an opportunity to sort of also, you know, improve their things and get students on board here? Definitely. Is that do you see that happening? This is a wonderful opportunity for India right now to uh, build a, an amazing education system. That uh, what, it, what it, India could be doing is to, you know, these professors, because universities are going to be downsizing over here. A lot, a lot of the top professors here are Indians. I mean, when Indians come here, they're amazed that the deans of universities, presidents of universities are Indians, top academics are Indians, top scientists are Indians, right? A lot of those people are going to want to come back to India right now. So if India can open up new universities and bring in the Western curriculums and the Western ways of teaching and so on, it can have a big advantage. And by the way, Ram, Ram I want to take a detour because I was in India um, in October and then again in uh, uh, December. And I met with uh, Professor Anil, I can't pronounce his last name, the chairman of the AICTE, Shab. Okay. He's going to be very angry if he sees this. Shab Subhade. And I met mm-hmm. with Amitabh Kant, uh, the head of, uh, uh, of uh, why am I forgetting this? The, the head of um, the National Planning Commission. Uh, right. Uh, I, I, I'm getting old, my friend. Niti I mean, Ayog. Niti I, Ayog. Niti absolutely. And I made a big offer to them because um, I've been studying Indian education and I have the most advanced curriculum in the world. I offered it to India. Basically, what I said was, that, look, I want to gift this to India, that we could actually create a one year course from this, which teaches students about all the amazing technologies. And if India implemented this, students from all over the world would, would want to come to India to learn there because it's the most advanced curriculum in advancing technologies in the world. Over the next few weeks, um, uh, you know, Ram, you are connecting with Tarun. I want to make some of my lectures available to Indian students so they can see what I teach and how I teach it, how Tarun and I teach it. You should, you know, f- uh, do a follow up post on that and make some of the curriculum available so Indians can see exactly what I'm teaching and how they can learn this and how it gives them a strategic advantage. So, what we need is more people like me, more professors like me offering their curriculum to India. And, and we need to now have India become the world leader in education. If India can become the IT powerhouse it became, why can't it become the education powerhouse? I know the AICTE and uh, Niti Aayog, all of these organizations are very open to it. That, you know, often they're criticized for being closed minded. They're not. These, the okay. people that I've met in the Indian education sector are very open minded. They want to revolutionize Indian education. They want to take it to the next leap. But well, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Let's bring the most advanced education systems to India. I mean, if you look at what Ronnie Screw, Screwwala is doing with Upgrad and a lot of these uh, startups over there, they're doing some amazing work. I mean, it's world-class uh, you know, education startups that have been started in India. Well, let's make India a hub for education. Let's have a goal that within five year, years, India becomes the place to come to for the world's most advanced education. India can do this. So that's what the goal is. <laughs> That's that's nice to hear. But do you see also see a lot of joint sort of degrees and things coming up? That's already there in place. But you know, do you see that happening a lot with the big tie-ups between American and Indian universities offering joint degrees? But then why do you need it? I mean, why have an inferiority complex? The reason why Indian universities do that is because they have an inferiority complex. They think that if they can associate with a, a big name university in the West, their value would increase. That's the old thinking. I mean, why not now have the best universities being founded in India so that you have American universities and European universities that want to affiliate with these Indian universities, that they come to India to say, hey, can we do a tie-up with you so we can uh, have the reputation that you have? That's what India's goal should be. Get over this you know, inferiority complex that the British left with India. Get over it. India can lead the world. It doesn't have to be at the mercy of you know, its white masters to give it credibility. India should lead the world in education. It should lead the world in these things. And it should give back to the world. So, so where do you see the sort of bottlenecks? You just mentioned that you met, uh, you know, senior people here. Are those the people who are pushing back against this, or is it the institution sort of, you know, old institutional pushback, or where where is the pushback? 
No. Ram, I didn't see any pushback. The people I met were very open-minded. I met many deans, many you know chancellors of universities. I, I met uh, the Niti Aayog executives. They were all as open-minded as could be. So I don't see any bottlenecks. I think we just have to, you know, make it happen. Again, I you know I was so uh, uh, touched by what I saw that I decided to to donate my entire curriculum. I mean, I literally I could have licensed this for millions of dollars. I said, no, I'm going to give it away to you. This is my gift to India. That I'm an American now. I you know. My loyalties are to America, but I'm still in India at heart. I still want to, you know, India, to see India succeed and prosper. And I want to see Indian students rise and not have to come to America for advanced education. So I made the contribution. So now with this, uh, you know, coronavirus, everything has been set back. Priorities have changed. Hopefully next year we can restart conversations and I can make it available in India. But, but this is what we need to have happen, is we need to bring the best ideas from all over the world to India and, and make it happen. India is open to it. I have, again, seen no resistance whatsoever. From from over there. Oh, okay, but you know we do have uh, certain institutionalized systems in place which are slowly, I suppose, slowly being eroded. But uh, do you see how what what kind of time frame are you looking at for this to sort of take off? I mean, if, if it were to take off post this pandemic, I would have a goal of within five years transforming Indian education. That you know maybe you leave the old stuff there, leave the IITs, IIMs the way they are. But let's create the next generation. Let's create, you know, the Carnegie Mellons, the Harvards in India, and and start afresh and bring in new curriculum, new thinking, and uh, uh, you know, again, you bring some faculty back from the West. You take the top Indian faculty. You bring people in from, uh, you know, uh, all over the world, and you rethink it. And because technology, you know, uh, by the way, I have a book called Driving the Driverless Car. The Indian edition of that is yes. available it's up to date. Uh, that talks yes. about all the amazing technology advances that are possible. That's the future. The, you know, India doesn't want to now catch up to yesterday. We don't want yesterday's engineering curriculum. We don't want yesterday's humanities curriculum. Forget all that nonsense. Let's move forward now. Let's plan for the future. And let's now teach Indian students how to build advancing technologies that can disrupt the entire world, that can better the world. So we build new universities, new curriculum, which are focused on the forward. So India doesn't catch up. It leapfrogs the West in education. That's what India should be doing right now. What kind of infrastructural needs would be there for something like this to happen? There's no magic required here. You just, you know, it's all about people. If I can teach my curriculum online, again, uh, you know, hopefully you'll post samples of this in the next few weeks. If I can teach online, there's no requirement here. I mean, technology has become cheap now. You have the, you know, people are watching this on smartphones. Those smartphones are more right. powerful than the crazy supercomputers of the 1970s. In the 1970s, there were export restrictions to India. You couldn't export supercomputers. The phones you have in your hands are something like 40 times more powerful than those crazy supercomputers were. Everyone can afford them now. So all the mm -hmm. technologies, you mentioned 3D printers. 3D printers are becoming dirt cheap. Within uh, two or three years, they'll cost you know as much as smartphones do. Uh, uh, virtual reality headsets, they'll cost as much as smartphones during the next three or four years. So all the technologies necessary for this are available. There's no reason why India can't do this starting today, literally. So oh, I mean, since, since you also happen to be, you know, uh, a technology uh, and entrepreneur and things like that at one end, what do you think 5G is going to do to this education system? Is that, be, is that going to be a... Ram, 5G is overhyped. I mean, uh, if you have Wi-Fi, fast Wi-Fi, you already have everything you need. I mean, this is something which, um, you know, um, um, uh, the uh, vendors have been putting out. Um, the internet connections I get in, in, um, in New Delhi and Bangalore, believe it or not, on my smartphone when I'm there are better than what I get in Silicon Valley. I mean, look at the choppiness of the video over here. I'm, I'm on AT&T right now, and there, but I'm supposed to have 60 megabit internet access, yet it sucks. You have better access in, 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 in India than we have over here in Silicon Valley. So it's fast enough to do everything. That's so nice to hear. A lot of people might disagree with you. I, I know that that's really, really, really very nice to hear. When I tweet this, I get attacked from India saying, have you used it? I said, yes, have you come to Silicon Valley and used the pathetic internet over here? So Indians always have an inferiority complex about everything Indian. And yes, it's irregular and it's choppy and so on, but but don't feel inferior here. I mean, you you, you have it pretty good over there. But regardless, getting back to your question about 5G, 5G will make it faster. But what we have today uh, with the uh, 4G LTE is fast enough to do almost everything you need to do. So 5G, there's no magic here. It's overhyped nonsense. 
So you can do everything you need to do with fast Wi-Fi and with LTE today. And you've got it all over India today. So there's no reason, reason not to be building all these advanced systems today. Yes, but that's interesting because, you know, uh, there, there was one report which said that India produces a whole bunch of engineers, you know, every year, uh, millions of them, but a whole bunch of them are unemployable because they don't have the other kind of skills. How does one resolve that? Ramon and I published a seminal research and if you go back and look at the research I did on India's education system, I That's published right. seven yes. papers in the most prestigious publications on this. That uh, what India did, what I documented was that, it, that uh, the vast majority of, of graduating students from Indian colleges uh, didn't have the skills necessary to, to be in the workforce. But what did India do was they started doing onboarding programs to re-educate uh, the Indians. If you Google the words, how the disciple became the guru, I wrote a paper about how India's IT industry was reskilling its workforce. India learned to compensate for its weak, weak education system. So what I'm saying is that you build new, new universities, new curriculum, which have the latest and greatest uh, technologies there. I'm volunteering my, my curriculum to India. And you mm -hmm. move forward. Forget about the past. Forget about apologizing for what it is. Forget the inferiority complexes. Move forward. Look at what's possible today and rebuild the education system and, and leap ahead of the rest of the world and then help the rest of the world by solving the grand challenges of humanity. That's my message to India. Well, that, that's a, you know, a, a great message to sort of you know, uh, look at. But I'll ask you one sort of a last question here. I mean, this is since we are sort of, uh, since you already have something else lined up, I, I believe, that in a fundamental way, in a very, very fundamental way, do you see education worldwide changing or are you, are you just you know, uh, in, in a much broader perspective? What are the three big changes you expect to see in education worldwide, higher education particularly? Right. The, the coronavirus was like an earthquake that hit the, the, uh, the, you know, you know, the education system worldwide because suddenly it was forced online. It would have taken a decade for, uh, for um, uh, you know, education to move online because uh, uh, the universities move at the, space, at the pace of molasses. They're very slow. They don't, you know, they teach advancing technologies, they teach engineering, but they don't apply it to themselves. So uh, 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 an, uh, you know, an earthquake happened in the education sector. Suddenly now there's a realization that you can teach online. So number one, the change has already happened. And it's going to, um, this is a permanent change. The next generation, the next changes are going to be with AI, artificial intelligence, and with virtual reality. In my book, Driving the Driver in the Sky, I have an entire chapter on the future of education. What I talked about was how um, you're going to have educational avatars that that do the the knowledge transfer that some students like like reading books others like playing games others like watching videos others like doing things well the the system will adapt to you the ai will teach you in the way you learn most effectively and then you're going to have the human element of it you're still going to have the guru the you know the, the coach teaching you the personal skills and teaching you all of that so it's going to be a hybrid system all of these things are going to happen in the next five years so Changes are set in place. India can lead these changes, and India can really transform uh, not only its education system but that of the world, just like it did with IT. India became an IT superpower because you know it, its engineers, its its um, uh, you know entrepreneurs took advantage of the opportunities. That same opportunity exists with education today. That that with this pandemic earthquake and with technology, it's time to now you know rethink education and bring it into the 21st century well that that's that's a very very positive kind of a note to sort of end this conversation with i would be truly grateful if you would consider coming back to us you know sometime in the future because we have a lot to talk about in terms of how education can think and i'm sure there's a lot of interest in the way you are approaching the whole issue so thank you very very much for being with us i really appreciate it and you know it's a delight to have you I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ram. It was good to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah.